let's go. Okay, so we, we start. So it is my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Tessen Kim from uh, Yonsei University. Um, so uh, Tessen has uh, done his uh, PhD in uh, Oxford, where we, uh, where we met uh, together yeah. there. And, uh, and then you did a, a postdoc in Princeton and uh, another postdoc in, uh, in Cambridge. And uh, hereafter, you, uh, you got uh, your tenure track and position, current position in, uh, in Yonsei uh, University in Seoul. Um, so Tesson is, uh, is now uh, uh, an expert and, uh, and a leader on uh, galaxy formation uh, problems, uh, model with uh, direct hydrodynamical uh, simulations. And, uh, and uh, your current uh, um, research topic is about galaxies at that very high redshift and, uh, and galaxies as, as sources of uh, organization of the, of the universe. And this is what you will talk about today. So the floor is yours, please. Thank you for the introduction, Johan, and thanks for the invitation. And it's my great pleasure to give a colloquium at IAP. Uh, I would like to apologize for not joining and talking to you in person because of the corona pandemic situation. It was not possible to make a trip this time, but I know IAP is a great place to be as I visited there multiple times. And I hope I can do that in the near future. And today I'd like to talk about reanalization of the universe with 12 galaxies and some issues related to this topic. And many of the slides that I'm gonna show you today are based on the work that I did with my collaborators listed here. And some slides are based on, and also students at Yonsei, I shouldn't forget about it. Um, and some slides are based on our ongoing efforts. Uh, so if you have any question, feel free to ask. And if you have any suggestion or criticism, I'd love to hear that as well. So I was told that, the, um, these, that there will be audience with uh, various backgrounds, science backgrounds. So I'm gonna start with a very general introduction for those who are not familiar with this topic, like uh, what is reanalization and what do we know from observations. And then I will spend a little bit of time on uh, why dwarf galaxies are thought to be, uh, thought as a main driver of reanalization. And then I will uh, also talk about what kind of processes are involved in reanalization. And we'll, we'll discuss potential impact of the unresolved CGM and why uh, it's so difficult to find Lyman continuum leakers. Okay, so this movie shows how structures form in a lambda CDM universe. So in the very early universe, everything was smooth, but there were tiny fluctuations which developed into walls of filaments through gravitational interactions. And galaxies we know today form inside this filament or at the intersection of the filament as, um, as Christoph nicely showed in his paper. For instance, you can see that hot bubbles, which correspond to hot gas created by newly formed stars, appear all along these uh, filamentary structures. And during this process, massive stars and possibly black holes and form as well, and they produce Lyman continuum photons. So Lyman continuum photons are the photons with energy greater than 13.6 electron volt, and they ionize uh, neutral hydrogen. And this movie shows how the ionized bubble grow uh, in a cosmological volume. And you can see that it starts from uh, very locally, but then they uh, expand and merge to form a bigger bubbles. And at some point, almost all of the hydrogen in the, in the simulated universe here is ionized, which we call uh, reionization. And this process heats up the hydrogen to 20,000 Kelvin or so because ionization produces a free electron that carries extra energy or residual energy from Lyman continuum radiation. And these are used to increase the temperature of the ambient or intergalactic medium. And this high temperature prevents gas from collapsing, thereby suppressing the formation of really uh, tiny structures in the universe. So here the left panel shows the distribution of gas in a simulated universe without reanalization, uh, where you can see these filamentary structures are very crispy and prominent, just like the dark matter structures. But with the uh, radiation from stars, you can see that these crispy structures are gone because of the photonization heating. 
uh, and they also suppress the creation of the dark matter halo. And so here I'm plotting uh, uh, the dark matter halo mass versus the baryonic mass inside the baryon fraction to be precise, baryon fraction inside the dark matter halo. And you can see that as reionization proceeds, the fraction of baryon inside a dark matter halo reduces uh, like a 10% uh, or, or more. So understanding reionization is important, not only from the perspective of the thermal history of the intergalactic medium, but also in the theory of galaxy formation. And that is why I think people are very interested in reionization overall. And fortunately, we know a couple of things about reionization, which I'm going to explain uh, in, the, in, the, in the upcoming slides. So this uh, figure shows the basic history of the universe. So CMB photons start uh, here, and the universe was dark until the first stars show up around redshift of 30 or so. And these first stars explode as a supernova or hypernova ejecting metals, and these metals uh, stimulate the formation of second generation of stars, sec sorry, second generation of galaxies, which we think responsible for reionization that has ended around redshift six or so. Then how do we know that the reionization or universe becomes fully ionized by redshift six? Because if there is a tiny amount of neutral hydrogen along the pathway of the quasar absorption spectrum, it leaves some imprints in the, in the quasar spectrum. So just to give an idea, I brought this mo uh, nice movie made by Andrew Punson. Uh, so this movie is about a Lyman Alpha forest and there is a quasar with a known spectrum. And you will see that every time it just crosses or pass through the neutral patch of the sky, neutral patch of the universe, it, uh, the Lyman Alpha photons are scattered off the line of sight and there will be uh, continuum photons that are observed by the neutral neutral uh, hydrogen. So you will see that every time it crosses the neutral patch, it just, uh, the lemon alpha is uh, scattered off and is, uh, the spectrum itself, of course, is uh, shifted, rather shifted. So you can imagine that if there is a chunk of, I mean, big chunk of neutral hydrogen, all the uh, flux blueward of this lemon alpha will be observed. And that is called gun Peterson trough. And this is actually confirmed in observations of quasar spectrum in 2001. So here, this, this plot shows the quasar spectrum from high redshift to low redshift. And you can see that distant quasar has no flux or uh, blue word of lemon alpha. But you can see a little bit of residual or transmitted flux blue word of lemon alpha at lower redshifts, lower redshift quasars. And we can actually quantify this transmitted fraction as a function of redshift. And you can see that by redshift six or so, the universe becomes opaque to Lyman continuum radiation. And here, 0 0.001 uh, correspond to roughly speaking 99.9999% of the ionized volume. So we people say that universe becomes fully ionized after redshift six or so. And there has been a recent interesting development as well uh, that uh, along some sight lines, these Lyman alpha opacities are bigger than uh, previously thought, which means that along some direction at least, the reionization might have ended a little late, like a uh, redshift 5.5. Another useful constraint on reionization comes from polarization signal from CMBs. And because the CMB photons scatter with electron, they give us an idea how much electron scattering has occurred. And this is essentially um, about the history of reionization. For instance, if our universe is ionized pretty early, like redshift 10 or even earlier than the Thomson optical depth, which is proportional to the volume filling fraction of ionized hydrogen will, will be large. Conversely, if reionization happens pretty late, like redshift six or so, then the volume filling fraction is gonna be low. So the optical depth is gonna be low as well. And the latest measurement from the flunk data suggests the tau of uh, 0.5 to 0.06. So together with the Lyman uh, alpha, I main quasar absorption uh, studies, these two constraints provide a very useful uh, information about you know whether some reionization model is reasonable or not. 
So then what about the, the source for reanalyzation? I mean, reanalyzation itself is a very simple process and any astrophysical system that can generate Lyman continuum radiation can be a source of reanalyzation. So this includes all the stars and the accreting black holes can be a, uh, another source or another candidate for reanalyzation and even microquasar shocks or decay of sterile neutrinos, they can be also, they can also contribute to the reanalyzation uh, of the universe. And in this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on two leading candidates, which, is, uh, which are OV stars. So these are essentially galaxies and uh, black holes. So for, uh, first of all, uh, we know there has been in the, in the last five years or so, there has been an interesting development that uh, quasars, especially the, the faint AGNs might be able to explain the reanalyzation history of the universe. So this, this has been disputed um, uh, in the literature quite a bit. And the latest uh, paper by Girish Kulkarni suggests that if we plot the hydrogen photoionization rate, so these are data from uh, Lyman Alpha studies and this red line correspond to the, the hydrogen photoionization rate coming from AGNs integrated uh, down to the uh, luminosity of eight, minus 18. So this is really faint AGN. So even if we integrate down to minus 18, really faint AGN, the hydrogen photoionization rate we can get from the AGN is an order of magnitude smaller than what is uh, observed at high redshift. So AGN seems to be secondary, at least for the contribution to the total budget for reanalyzation. And of course, one might say that perhaps over dense region might be dominated by AGN, not galaxies, because we often uh, detect these black holes in over dense regions. So that was the motivation of this obelisk simulation uh, that Max and Travis uh, and myself did last year. So we simulated over dense region, including the radiation from stars or, and also including uh, radiation from AGNs. And what we found is that even though there are many black holes in this over dense region, the emissivity at 912 angstrom, so that's essentially the Lyman continuum radiation, these are orders of magnitudes uh, smaller than the contribution from galaxies. So even though there are many bright AGNs in these overdense regions, galaxies still dominate uh, in terms of uh, the photon budget for reanalyzation. So in the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus on these galaxies. So of those galaxies, then how do we actually infer the relative contribution from galaxies with different masses? Um, one simple way is to use this uh, reanalyzation equation first put, put forward by Madao and collaborators. So this simple equation dictates um, how the, um, the ionized bubble grow in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the universe. So this Q is the volume filling fraction of uh, ionized bubble. So this is the change of the uh, ionized, the change in the, in the volume filling fraction. And the second term here is the source term. And here, and the H is the background density of the universe. And this is the number of ionizing photons that are escaping into the IGM. So if we want to expand or uh, make the bubbles grow, then we need definitely more photons than the uh, background density of the universe. And this third term here is the sink term. So this is about recombination. So if some bubbles are large, then the recombination will be large correspondingly. And uh, this uh, T bracket, this is the recombination time scale in the IGM, encapsulates all the um, detailed structure about the IGM because the IGM has some density fluctuations there. But fortunately, IGM itself is not really multi-phased like the, uh, on the ISM, so we can quantify the clumping factor in the simulation. So we know roughly what the number should be for this uh, T bracket. So the question is, how do we get this number? F escape times the number of, I mean, photon production rate. There are at least two different ways. The first one is based on observations. So if we start from UV luminosity function, then this UV luminosity function can tell us about star formation rate. And with, a little, with the assumptions about SED, then we can infer the photon production rate uh, for a given redshift. Then what is 
And what remains to be determined is this escape fraction. But unfortunately, this escape fraction is very difficult to, to infer from observation. So the uh, people usually come up with some simple model that depends on surface star formation rate density or our flow rates. And they just change this free parameter until they match the observed um, in con constraints like optical depths or um, the, um, the end of the uh, reionization. And this is not a simple task at all. And I'm going to go back, I'm going to come back to this, uh, this model later. And another method is, is to use dark matter halos. And this is my preferred method because everything is intertwined through uh, dark matter halo mass. So if we have dark matter halo mass functions and, and this, which is very well determined, then all we have to decide is the stellar mass to halo mass relation and the escape fraction as a function of halo mass. So for a given dark matter halo, once we know how many stars are there and how, well, what fraction of the, escape, I mean, the Lyman continuum photons are escaping, then we can get an idea how many photons are escaping for a given redshift. So we can measure, which, so, and what we need to do is to measure this stellar mass to halo mass relation at high redshifts and the escape fraction from individual dark matter halos. And that was the purpose of running this cosmological zoom in radiation hydrodynamic simulations. So in this study, we uh, just focused on just nine samples because we wanted to have high resolution, as high resolution as possible. And here, I'm gonna show you one example how we can actually measure it. So this is gas density, and this is H2 fraction, and this is gas metallicity. And you're gonna see that whenever stars are formed, uh, there will be ionized bubble uh, appeared here. And afterwards, there will be uh, some, um, it's not playing somehow, but yeah, whenever stars are formed, there is a, a escape of Lyman continuum radiation, which just ionized the neighboring region. Okay, so this is how, uh, what we get from these type of simulations. So stellar mass to halo mass relation, just for those who are familiar with the various relation uh, at ratio of zero, this, is, this dotted line is the ratio of zero relation. And we also measure the escape fraction as a function of halo mass. Uh, and of course, we have to use a luminosity weighted escape fraction uh, to, to, you know, to, to, to apply to this you know, dark matter halo. And together with the dark matter halo mass function, then we can calculate the number of, I mean, number density of ionizing radiation as a function of redshift. So that's what we, uh, what I uh, got uh, in this, in this uh, plot as the gray line. And once we know this gray line that we can put here and then solve this simple equation to get the evolution of Q, volume filling fraction. And once we know this Q, then we can infer, we can even calculate these optical depths and compare to the Planck measurement. And what is interesting from ex this exercise is that if you look at you know, contribution from different halo masses above redshift six, so this is redshift six, then you can see that most of the majority of ionizing radiation is coming from this orange, green, and blue lines. And these are all you know, small documented halos between 10 to the eight to 10 to the 11 solar mass. So they are dwarf size uh, documented halos. So even with just dwarf size documented halos, we managed to ionize the universe with, I mean, by redshift seven, which is a little earlier than what is, uh, uh, what is inferred from quasar observation study. And even the optical depth is greater than the, the free per value from the Planck measurement. Then we can go even one step further and simulate the propagation of this radiation in this in the uh, in a cosmological volume. So previously, I just zoomed in individual dark matter halo and measure this k fraction. But instead of doing it, we can just run the simulation and and see how the uh, the Lyman continuum radiation propagates. So that was the motivation of this spin simulation led by Yoki Rochdal. And we wanted to have, you know, we wanted to resolve as many, I mean, as much structure as possible in the simulation so that we can, we don't have to assume anything about the escape fraction. 
uh, in the simulation. But the price to pay is that because the resolution is, is really high resolution, uh, so simulation is really high resolution, we couldn't make the box of the simulation really large. So our simulation covers only 10 megaparsec on a side or 20 megaparsec side. And the, the, main, the main targets in this uh, simulated box is between 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 11 solar mass of dark matter halo. So that is precisely what I uh, said before. So let's see. So this shows the flux coming from um, stars. So there, there will be a flickering things. So these are essentially all the lights coming from the stars. And at some point, you will see that these um, bubbles just fill the entire uh, volume of the simulation. And we actually found that the universe is a simulated volume is ionized a bit earlier, like Redshift 7, like I said. So if I, uh, this one is, is the photoionization rate as a function of Redshift, and you can see that by Redshift 6 or so, it's fully ionized. And if we plot the, uh, the uh, fraction of volume filling fraction of neutral hydrogen, uh, we actually ionize the simulate universe pretty early, like Redshift 7. And this is a little earlier than, like I said, than uh, the uh, than observations. And this is, of course, not a, a, I mean, it's probably better to have the data on top of each other, but we didn't, we don't really uh, uh, worry too much about this because the SCD we put in in the simulation is a sort of extreme model. So we use the binarity fraction of 100%, and we know the binarity uh, fraction is not necessarily 100%. Uh, 100 in the other extreme where we assume no binarity, which is uh, the famous version Charlotte model, then we actually didn't, we couldn't actually reanalyze the universe by resting seven, sorry, six. So this depends on li a little bit about the input physics. But what's good news here is that if we were to compare the UV luminosity function, which is an independent measure or a matrix to, to see whether simulations are doing okay, we actually uh, reproduce the observed UV luminosity function between redshift six to redshift nine or so. So if somebody asked whether you know, dwarf galaxies alone can uh, uh, ionize the universe, I would say yes, but of course we have, we have a couple of uncertainties in the infophysics like a SED and also volume of the simulation uh, can change the exact uh, timing for the reanalyzation. And coming back to the, uh, the, the question that I um, asked earlier, so people might wonder whether there is any correlation between escape fraction and at any other galactic properties. So Yoki measured this escape fraction as a function of the surface and star formation rate averaged over 10 mega year and try to plot all the data from the simulation. And you can see that this black line, sorry, black dots, which are the luminosity weighted mean escape fraction didn't seem to correlate very well with uh, this uh, surface and star formation rates. And this could be partially due to the, um, the you know, sporadic nature of the cosmic accretion. So we also ran the simulation that is in isolated environment. So this is isolated disk simulation with a normal gas fraction. And this one is with the, um, the gas mass that is five times larger than this one. So this is much uh, 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 th uh, dense and, and thicker in scale height, but we couldn't find the, um, the any correlation with the surface and star formation rate. And we also compared with the outflow rates. And again, there is uh, no clear correlation between the escape fraction and the outflow rates. And this is understandable because uh, this escape fraction is the instantaneous quantities, okay? This fluctuates quite a bit, uh, at least on a time scale of 10 mega year. And, but this one, is the outflow rates, this does not fluctuate very, uh, very much. So it just changes on a time scale of 100 mega year. This one changes uh, on a time scale of less than 10 mega year. So there is no wonder why there is, these two do not correlate very well. 
what is more interesting is the correlation, no correlation between the escape fraction and the star formation rate density, because naively, one may think that if there is a starburst, then this will create uh, some you know, low density channels through which the lemon continuum photons might escape, uh, but we couldn't find any strong correlation between the two. So we wanted to see why that's the case. And so uh, we looked into one individual case. Uh, this is actually quite typical uh, in the simulation from this isolated galaxy simulation. So whenever there is um, a high escape fraction events, they always start from some local collapse. And this local collapse leads to a very bursty star formation. And then this bursty star formation blow gas away nearby. And, uh, and then these low density channels are created. So by the way, this is the gas density and this is the neutral fraction. And these low density channels are created once this uh, neighboring gas is blown away by radiation feedback in this particular case. And you can see that the majority of stars are formed here or whereas escape fraction is maximized somewhere here. So there is always a mismatch between the peak of star formation and peak of escape fraction. And of course, we have to uh, think very hard whether this mismatch is because of uh, the, the limit, I mean, the limited resolution. Because if we think about giant molecular clouds, giant molecular, cl giant molecular clouds are very prevalent and they sometimes have very porous and structure. So this means that we might be, we might come, came, uh, we might come to the wrong conclusion because of limited, uh, limited resolution. And that was the motivation of running this prayer line uh, uh, simulation. So this is a radiation magnetohydrodynamic simulations of GMCs. So we, and we, unit, we, uh, we wanted to use a very high resolution. So we couldn't really, you know, include the ISM component here. So we are just simply looking at the GMC scale, but we wanted to uh, look at uh, sim uh, GMCs with various cloud mass and metallicity, magnetic fields, turbulence strengths, and geometry. Like for instance, this is more like a spherical, this is a filamentary, this is more like a homogeneous. And what we found is that in general, these clouds are disrupted pretty rapidly by uh, radiation feedback. So these small dots represent the newly formed stars and this newly formed star this just blow neighboring region uh, via photoionization hitting. And this happens on a very short time scale of three to five mega year. So within a five mega year or so, this entire cloud is dispersed. So by the time supernova explode, there is no GMC component here in this simulation. So the, the supernova will contribute to you know, making some channels for, I mean, in the ISM scale, not on the GMC scale. And we um, could check the uh, escape fraction from this simulation. And unlike, well, unlike the concern that I uh, mentioned before, even though the structure is very turbulent and porous initially, the stars are always formed in the densest, densest pocket of the GMC. So it takes time to blow things away. Uh, and so the escape fraction increases rather slowly compared to star formation rate. So we, we tend to see this mismatch between the peak of star formation and the peak of, uh, peak of um, the escape fraction still. And they don't randomly fluctuate just because of the turbulent structure and they tend to increase just like before and you know, rather monotonically. And this increase in escape fraction, even on this uh, GMC scale is set by the interplay between the star formation and disruption of the cloud. What is also interesting is this relation between the escape fraction versus star formation efficiency. What we found in this simulation, in this set of simulation is that the escape fraction is maximized at some specific star formation efficiency, like a 20%. This was uh, completely unexpected. When we, had, when we have um, clouds with a high surface density, they, they end up forming more stars. And if we I mean, naively thinking, if there are more stars, then the photoionization hitting might be more effective. 
So we might expect to see higher, I mean, more efficient escape from this GMC. But that was not the case because higher density, higher gas uh, surface density means it's also higher in terms of volumetric density. And this higher volumetric density delays the propagation of ionization front inside the GMC. And as a result, it, take, it took a longer time to, uh, to just disperse um, disperse the, um, the cloud and the escape fraction dropped as, I mean, with increasing star formation efficiency. Conversely, if the star formation efficiency is very small, like 1%, uh, of course, this can be driven by various sources like a strong turbulence or a strong magnetization. And if that's the case, then the number of ionizing radiation, number of uh, Lyman continuum photon is limited. So again, the leakage becomes very inefficient with, the, uh, with decreasing star formation efficiency. And this graph tells us a very interesting um, thing about the star, uh, star, uh, starburst. So even if the star formation efficiency is really high, that doesn't mean that uh, we're gonna get really high escape fraction, meaning that not all of the star formation burst would lead to a high, uh, star form a high escape fraction. Another interesting point from this uh, figure is that overall, this escape fraction ranges from something like 20% to 70%. And this is really high escape fraction, okay? Normally, one would require, uh, one would need something like 10% uh, of the escape fraction to explain the cosmic reionization. But this is not a problem because ISM can also observe Lyman continuum radiation, this ionizing radiation. So we went back to this ISM simulation, I mean, the galactic scale simulation, and see how, you know, what fraction of this gate fraction is reduced by this ISM. So here we looked at uh, two different simulations, as I, I, like I said, one normal gas fraction and one uh, high gas fraction, and tried to estimate what is the escape fraction as a function of distance from each Lyman continuum source? And we found that on 100 parsec scale, which is basically the GMC scale, it was like a 50% ish. But by the time it leaves the galaxy, like five kiloparsec, so five kiloparsec is this, uh, this much. By the time it leaves the, the galaxy, the escape fraction drops by a factor of five or a factor of 10. So starting from the GMC, the escape fraction was at 20% to 70%. This is set by radiation feedback, like I said. And on galactic scale, this is reduced to five to 20%. And the supernova feedback plays some role here because it's, uh, it regulates the, the, the um, um, balance between the gravity and the uh, thermal pressure in the disk. So if this escape, escape fraction is uh, what we get for on galactic scale, then the naturally rising question is, what about the CGM? If this is, a, this is already the number that is required by the reionization theory, then does that mean that there is no contribution from the CGM? This is something that we should, we should uh, uh, worry about. And I think this is a, a legitimate concern because simulations like ours often underproduce the neutral hydrogen in the CGM. For instance, in the simulation that I showed here or before, uh, you can see that the column density here is pretty low compared to the column density here. And we can't really see any prominent structure is just above three kiloparsec away from the mid plane. So, uh, we of course need to understand why that's the case and there has been a uh, there has been quite a, bit, uh, quite a bit of papers before to understand why that's the case. And one of the paper, uh, I mean, if you are interested, you, you can uh, look at this uh, paper by Rochdal and then myself in 2017. And uh, we found that the outflows are not strong as needed in general in, 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 you know, in galactic scale simulations. For instance, Mass loading factor measured at 10 kiloparsec away from the mid plane is less than 0.1, which is much smaller than observations. 
and also simulations that could reproduce um, the stellar mass to halo mass correlation at redshift to zero. Normally, mass loading factor should be on the order of one or even larger in this type of dark matter halo or galaxy. And we also found a very um, intriguing signal in the Lyman alpha as well. So before I go into the detail about the Lyman alpha, I prepare a couple of slides for those who are not familiar with the Lyman alpha. So Lyman alpha is a very useful probe of gas, kin uh, gas kinematics and uh, column density because it's a resonant line. So if the Lyman alpha starts from the line center, it's trapped inside this small region before its a frequency is shifted from the line center. So by the time it leaves some medium, it, uh, it has this characteristic double peak. And the, the separation of the double peak is dictated by the optical depth of the medium. So if some medium is optically thick, then the Lyman alpha will be scattered more. And uh, in order for the Lyman alpha photon to escape from the medium, it has to shift in frequency even more, pro uh, even more, pro uh, even more. So this separation of the two peaks uh, 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 talk about, I mean, explain, is it, uh, that, that explains the optical depth of the medium. Another interesting property of the Lyman alpha is, is that um, it reflects the kinematics of the medium. So if the medium is static, it forms these two peaks. But if the medium is expanding, then it preferentially observes light in the blue peak, leaving only a red peak here. So if some medium is expanding, there is no blue peak left. So only red peak. And if some medium is in falling, then only blue peak uh, becomes prominent. So the relative ratio between the red peak and the blue peak tells us about whether the mass the gas is expanding or uh, in falling. So we use Monte Carlo Lyman Alpha uh, transfer code, RASCAS, to post-process our simulated galaxy here. And compared with the local observations of luminous compact galaxies. So here I plotted separation of the two peak and the escape fraction in 900 Armstrong. So this is a Lyman continuum escape fraction and a, this is a measure of uh, optical depths. And you can see that compared to the local compact galaxies, our simulation is still a, a, a little bit below, I mean, placed a little bit below than the observed sequence. And what is more interesting is this plot, which tells us whether the medium, the scatter is, is outflowing or inflowing. And you can see that many of the data points are placed below 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 which means that the scatter is uh, definitely outflowing, whether, uh, whereas our simulated point is uh, above 0.5-ish. So that means we are lacking outflow, neutral outflow in the simulation. So this potentially means that we are underestimating the column density in the CGM region, C I mean circumgalactic, uh, sub circumgalactic uh, region here, upward. The question is, how much of the CGM is needed to reproduce this sequence. So we uh, did a very simple experiment. So here, this is the um, image before we do anything about the simulation. This is just, you know, a simulation, uh, um, I mean, the prediction from the simulation. And you can see that neutral fraction is below uh, 10 to the minus six. Is it, you know, virtually ionized, you know, almost all ionized. But if we change the, the neutral fraction to 10 to the minus three. So 10 to the minus three is still a very you know, tiny number. Uh, but if we change the number, this ionized uh, the, the neutral fraction to 10 to the minus three, then the separation of the two peaks increases dramatically to uh, something like a 400 to match this observed sequence without changing the escape fraction. This is, import this is important. So despite the fact that we changed the neutral fraction, the uh, optical depths to the Lyman continuum photon, it I mean, did not change a lot. So the escape fraction for the Lyman continuum radiation didn't change a lot. So that means the absorption of Lyman continuum by the CGM may not be uh, really significant. 
at least from this uh, this experiment. Of course, we need more observations because what I'm plotting, what I'm comparing here is the luminous compact galaxies, which are different from what we simulated here. So we actually simulated merging galaxies, which are compact than this one, but we found more or less the same result, at least from the simulation. So far, I've talked about uh, dwarf galaxies as a primary source of reionization, and but precisely speaking, we do not have any uh, observational ev yet, uh, evidence yet whether galaxies during the epoch of reionization are actually leaking 10% of Lyman continuum radiation. And this is because if there, even if there is a Lyman continuum radiation, this will be observed by neutral uh, hydrogen during the epoch of reionization. But in surveys like KBSS, uh, they, I mean, people infer the Lyman continuum escape fraction. This is the survey at redshift two to three. Uh, and their escape fraction in, in those redshift is like uh, 7%, which is quite close to what we see in the simulation. But there are only limited number of Lima continuum leakers observed today. And there is no guarantee that these are the same type of galaxies that reionize the universe. So it will be important to find as many Lyman continuum leakers as possible and study their physical conditions. But how, but how do we actually find Lyman continuum leakers? Like I said, we can't really simply use the star formation, I mean, surface star formation rate density, but there has been a recent suggestion, very interesting one, uh, saying that if we use the star formation rate density divided by star, uh, stellar mass, so this is quite similar to specific star formation rate, then we might be able to select um, galaxies with high escape fraction of uh, Lyman alpha photon. So this is not Lyman continuum photon, it's a Lyman alpha, but we, uh, um, Lyman alpha escape fraction is, uh, is, is, is to some extent correlated with the Lyman continuum escape fraction. So, so this could be one possible way of finding uh, Lyman continuum leakers. And we also found from our simulations things that uh, galaxies with a high uh, escape fraction tend to show very high specific uh, star formation rates. So when I'm, when I'm saying high specific star formation rates, it's above 10 uh, inverse giga year. So it's a really high specific star formation rates. Another interesting method is based on emission line ratios. And in 2014, the Kazima and Ouch um, uh, found a couple of Lyman continuum leakers and correlate, correlated with O3-2 ratio. And interestingly, they found that these Lyman continuum leakers showed a pretty high O3-2 ratio, and they uh, interpret, interpreted this as the, um, the effect of the ionization uh, parameter. So if some galaxy has may show high escape fraction, then chances are that the, uh, the column density of the medium in the, in the galaxy is low, in which case the ionization parameter is gonna increase. And since O3-2 is a well-known quantity that can reflect the ionization parameter, they thought that this Lyman continuum escape fraction can be probably, I mean, the Lyman continuum leakers can be preferentially found by selecting uh, galaxies with a high O3-2 ratio. So we wanted to test this idea by actually post-processing our GMC scale simulation with Cloudy. So this one is a different simulation that I showed before. So this is a GMC with a 10 to the six solar mass, and we place the star particles in the simulation in order to control the star formation efficiency. And we use the various SEDs like the Bruges and Charlotte or BPOS to see the impact of the SED. And from this simulation, we took the number density, radiation field, and metallicity to feed into cloudy to calculate many emission lines for, uh, from the simulation. Of course, we couldn't post-process all the simulation data because we have something like 10 to the 10 cells in the simulation. And if, if I were to post-process with cloudy, this is gonna take 3 million hours, which is uh, really you know, enormous. So we couldn't do it because, of the, um, because it's taking too much time. So we had to use, we were forced to use machine learning technique to, to calculate the emission lines from the simulation. And this is the one example um, showing the actual cloudy, I mean, the emission, uh, luminosity map of the O3 line 
uh, calculated from cloudy. So this is the actual calculation, and this is the model prediction from the machine learning. And you can't really see any difference between the two, meaning that machine learning model works pretty well. And we found that the total difference is like uh, on, the, on the order of just a, you know, a couple of few percent. So with this machine learning, we um, post process the radiation hydrodynamic simulations of the GMC. So this is the density and temperature from the simulation. And this is O3 line map from this GMC. And this is O2 line uh, from uh, predicted from the cloudy plus the machine learning. And you can see that O3 line is more confined in the central region, whereas O2 is more spread, I mean, more, more you know, distributed. And this is understandable because O2, uh, I mean, can be uh, formed by, uh, via less strong radiation field and the density required is lower to, to have this uh, O2. But compared to O2, O3, um, compared to uh, O2, O3 requires really strong radiation field and high density. So it drops pretty rapidly as the, and the cloud is dispersed. So this is O3 luminosity from predicted from the entire GMC. And this is O2 luminosity. So if we divide these two lines, then uh, we can get the O3 2 ratio. And you can see that initially O3 2 ratio is pretty large, like 100, but it drops uh, pretty rapidly to uh, like a 20%. And compared to ESK fraction, it seems you know there is an anti-correlation between the two. And this is opposite to what I said before. So this is very interesting. And our interpretation is that you know, this is a very you know, short time scale. This is between zero to 10 mega year. And observationally, it's very difficult to find this galaxy, I mean, galaxies with this age, galaxies with this age. Usually we're gonna observe the light uh, somewhere here. And what, what's gonna happen is then, when the galaxy shows the highest diffraction, the O3-2 is gonna be still high, uh, like a 20. And this 20 is somewhere here, okay? And if we continue to run the simulation and, and calculate the O3-2 ratio, then we're gonna get a very low O3-2, which uh, is basically somewhere here. So we may be observing galaxies with high escape and, and high O3-2 because the populations are still very young. And this, this was the case even when we look at the cosmological simulations. So we also post-process the cosmological simulations of galaxies and uh, try to plot the escape fraction versus O3-2 ratio. And this is by Holly Katz. Uh, and myself, and this is done by a different group by Cockbarrow uh, et al. And you can see that whenever there is a, a lemon liquors like uh, above 20% or, or so, it's probably better to find the galaxies with a high O3-2 ratio. Uh, likewise, you know, they've, uh, this Cockbarrow et al found uh, something quite very similar. So if we were to find the lemon continuum liquors, is high O3 galaxies with high O3 to ratio is going to be um, a good candidate. And plus, with the high specific star formation rate, it's going to increase definitely the probability of finding Lyman continuum liquids. So, so far, I have to only talked about GMC scale, ISM scale, and also larger scale separately because we couldn't run the simulation all the way from galaxy scale to GMC. But now it's becoming possible to run those simulations. So we can run now the simulation, cosmological simulation that can resolve the GMC scale. So we are running uh, right now this uh, simulation with the 0.2 parasitic uh, resolution with this sync particle algorithm. This is exactly what people do to simulate the GMC. Uh, so this, the idea is to uh, really to decouple the star formation and the feedback as self consistently as possible and, and check the, the properties of the GMC we should expect from high redshift and also Lyman alpha profile and any other you know, observables we can think of. And then we can compute, we can compare uh, the you winner know, with observations. And of, of course, we will have to simultaneously look into other avenue like a different physics 
So for instance, radiation modulated cooling can change the, uh, the thermal status of the CGM cosmic ray pressure that uh, Goha and Johan developed um, can do a lot um, to the CGM region as well. And thermal conduction is also a very interesting avenue and even runaway stars can change the uh, some you know, features in the CGM. So this will be uh, interesting opportunities for uh, you know, upcoming uh, um, projects. So that's it for my talk. So I will leave you with my summary. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Desan. So uh, now it's time for questions. Please raise your hand. Can, uh, I can start if, uh, while people are still thinking. Um, so the, you mentioned the, the, the lack of uh, CGM gas uh, in your simulation. So uh, that is uh, uh, required because of, of larger mass of flow rates. So the, the, the thing is that if you want a, a larger mass of flow rates, uh, you can either, either uh, in, increase it by uh, having larger velocities or having larger uh, density, uh, which mm -hmm. results in different uh, uh, temperature structure, right, from the CGM. Uh, yes. So can you maybe a bit el elaborate a, a little bit more on the, on the consequences for escape fraction and, and so on and so forth? Yeah, so there are, like, like you said, there are two different ways of increasing outflow rates. One is, yeah, definitely to speed up the outflows. But if that's the case, then it will thermalize the outflow, you know, outflow medium. So in turn, it will the neutral fraction in the outflow is going to decrease. And we have uh, some idea whether this CGM region should be neutral or not by looking at the Lyman alpha halo uh, detected by a muse, for instance. And to have this extended Lyman alpha halo, in my understanding is that you need to have neutral neutral uh, CGM quite a bit. So if you just increase the, uh, the velocity, that's not going to help. And you need some sort of mechanism that can gently push it there, or uh, they, there could be some mechanism to, to uh, stimulate the, radi uh, the, the, you know, the radiative cooling in the CGM region. And one, one of the options is the radiation from, uh, from galaxies. OK. So this will, uh, so, so, so in practice, this will increase the, um, uh, the attenuation from the CGM or, or decrease the escape fraction from the CGM in principle. Yes, yes, exactly. So that's uh, what I was trying to say here. So even though, you know, we increase this neutral fraction to the level that can reproduce this Lyman alpha properties. Okay, so this is the one constraint we can think of, right? And, but that didn't change the escape fraction because um, the level of neutral hydrogen, neutral column density required is not necessarily really large or significant for in terms of the cross section uh, or opti optical depths to Lyman continuum radiation. So uh, it doesn't seem to change dramatically the escape fraction of Lyman continuum radiation. Yeah, uh, I have plenty of other questions, but I don't want to, to be the only one to ask. So please, Akim, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the nice talk. And the, so I can uh, maybe on the same point for the, uh, for the escape fraction. So here we increase, uh, for instance, the, um, the hydrogen ionizing, uh, uh, ionized hydrogen fraction. One of the scenarios for having high escape fraction in even high density regions is to have ionized channels, right? So what happens if you have you know, a homogeneous medium uh, for your galaxies? Yeah, so that's exactly what we are trying to simulate. Uh, we, we, we were trying to simulate, right? Uh, so like I said here, this one has a um, you know, really porous structure. Uh, so we have something like, a, uh, we have it tested up to a five parsec resolution, which is enough to resolve the ISM structure. So all we need to worry about is really GMC scale. And as I showed in a separate simulation, it's, uh, 
uh, the low density channel, yes, they, they are created, but they, they are not created in the middle of star formation. But after these stars, newly formed stars, just destroy the neighboring region. So it doesn't just go, I mean, I mean, so what I'm saying is that low density channel is not really like a you know, small solid angle, but you need to just blow the neighboring region to see the high escape fraction. Okay. Is that, is is that, that answer to your question? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And is this the, uh, also one of the reasons you have high escape fraction for um, low O3 to O2 ratios? Uh, so here, yeah, unfortunately we didn't see any, any uh, low O3-2 here, at least in the GMC scale. So in the GMC scale, everything is very young, right? So EK fraction at the uh, young, in this young, a, young age, EK fraction is pretty high. And I, I suppose you are talking about this, yes. right? Yeah, this. Yeah. And when the escape fraction, so the low O3-2 means that the, the age of the population is pretty low, uh, sorry, uh, uh, old. And old meaning this trend just continues to go down, right? So we are gonna get a very low O3-2, you know, aged population. So that's why, uh, and, and of course this high escape fraction is no longer, affecting your measurement because by by the time it becomes a 10 mega year or so you no longer have lemon continuum radiation right yeah so it's always a combination of different you know uh, star formation episodes and that is why low escape fraction correspond to low uh, or three two here okay thanks Uh, any other question? I had, uh, I had a question on, on, on binarity of stars uh, that you can uh, probably uh, elaborate on, on, on to this one. So the binarity uh, was uh, first invoked to delay a bit the, the ionization from stars, if I understood correctly, uh, in the first place. Uh, but you showed here that everything happen, happens very early. So do you still require uh, strong binarity to, to get a uh, um, correct reionization? So there's a very good question. Yeah, so in a simulation where we can't really resolve this GMC scale dynamics, what, what happened before, I think, is that we, need, we needed some time for the supernova to blow things away. And that was why there was a little delay, I mean, like a 10 mega year or so to blow things away. But if you resolve, start to resolve this GMC scale, then there is a possibility that we even you know, speed up the, uh, the propagation of the ionization front, in which case this binarity might not really be a concern anymore. So this is uh, yeah, definitely a concern. And I think we, uh, we should run the simulation with the uh, you know, GMC resolved in a cosmological setting and, and before, I mean, before we actually run the simulation, we can't really tell whether this binarity is really uh, doing something. Uh, but at least from the simulation with the binary, it's, uh, it seems, uh, yeah, it's doing quite a bit of job here. Yeah, I'm not sure whether that's a satisfactory answer. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it, it sounds a bit like binarity was introduced be, because of a lack of resolution, basically, to, to get the correct realization. And when you capture the, uh -huh. the, the scales of the GMCs, uh, then you don't require it anymore. Well, so binarity is, is uh, I mean, we know from observation that there are binary stars, mm -hmm. right? And that was the motivation of why we, we, we wanted to have it. Sure. It's not necessarily because, if we, it's okay, precisely, Speaking, we didn't run the you know the simulation with the uh, Bruges and Charlotte model first. We ran the the simulation with binarity first, and then we uh, ran the second simulation with the Bruges and Charlotte to see what differences uh, they make. I think, regardless of the uh, simulations, in the observations when you try to reproduce the escape fraction or the um, the SEDs of those galaxies that are Lyman continuum leakers. 
uh, you have a hard time reproducing the um, the ionizing part, so you need bi binary stars to reproduce those parts. So even in observations, we uh, we need the binarity. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see any end rising, uh, so uh, maybe we can stop here. So I will stop the recording.